You're very welcome to The Rugby Show, live here in the Eastside Tavern, brought to you in association with Volkswagen. My name is Volkswagen. I always do the German pronunciation, like Volkswagen. A fine car, Volkswagen, uh, if you're going to buy a car, buy a Volkswagen. Uh, <laughs> my name is Gavin Casey, our first guest. Well, actually, I, I stumbled upon an article earlier. Um, the top three young sports journalists you should know. Now, sadly, he is described in this article as a digital influencer, which... Uh, Nobody <laughs> nobody wants to be known as. It says, that, it says that he has played in both the Munster Academy and the French Third Division. This experience of playing rugby at a high level shows in his blogs. Blogs. He's a blogger. <laughs> <laughs> he's the only young man who every father in the country wants to, uh, their daughter to bring home. It is our own Murray Kinsella. Oh, he's shaking his head already. <laughs> How's the blogging going, Murray? Yeah, the blogs are going great. Thank you very much. No problem. Flattering words. Yeah. <laughs> Our main guest this evening. I'm not the main guest? No. Uh, I'm sorry to say. You're a blogger. <laughs> you are. You, you are influential, obviously, uh, digitally. But uh, no, not the main guest. I was on TV3 actually uh, last week and I was just plugging this show and I was talking about uh, Tomas Leary. You know he's here, let's be honest. And, uh, <laughs> and I was saying, um, uh, so I was plugging the show and I was saying that, you know, he's probably best known as a, as a Grand Slam winner. And one of the presenters said, no, 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 he's best known as a dancer. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then Michal O'Marherty was sitting next to me and he goes, no, 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 he's best. He's be <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Do you want to just swap seats? <laughs> He says, he says, no, no, 2001 All-Ireland Minor Hurling uh, winning uh, captain with Cork, son of the great Sean O'Leary. And here he is, <laughs> the son of Sean O'Leary, Tomas O'Leary. How are you? How are things? Good. Is this show going to be all about you, is it? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get on just fine. <laughs> Three, uh, three people who've represented Monster up here, albeit mine was, uh, yeah, you gave me the look. Now I, I represented them in handwriting in senior infants. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I know, Murray, that you came across Tomas on the field of play not so long ago. I was literally just telling Tomas this at the bar. Um, yeah, it was a painful experience, actually. I uh, went to a Monster senior training session when I was in the academy, my second one, I think. Um, and we were doing like the opposition team against the starting team. I think you were playing cast, maybe. And their 12 basically carries the ball all the time. So I was playing 12, carrying the ball a lot. Happened to get a couple of good carries to start. Ron O'Gara was at 10, so maybe not the strongest tackler. I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking, this is easy, you know? Professional rugby, it's not everything it was hyped up to be. And then all of a sudden, carrying off a scrum and bang, just gets smashed on my left. Uh, but, ooh. Oh! <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit like that. It was actually a little bit like that. It's no wonder there's a concussion problem in rugby at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm literally acting out here. Yeah, I'm, I'm literally acting out here. Take Bang, ten. from my left, Tomas O'Leary absolutely smashes me. It took me about four minutes to get up. James Colin runs over, just looks down at me. That's what it's like, kid. <laughs> so, yeah, hurtful, did he, did he stand down to you, Tomas? I don't remember that, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know where I am. I'm just probably picking on the tall, skinny lad to get a bit of confidence. So, Chicken uh, legs, as James Collins said afterwards, actually. Jeez, he was bullying you, was he? He was, he was picking on Yeah, me. I was just protecting Raj. It used to be, usually Wally did all the tackling for Raj, but the odd time I had to do a little bit too. Uh, you're back involved in GA, you know, uh, after, uh, after retiring from rugby. I mean, we first heard that you were going back playing for Aaron's own football. You were saying to me in September it was, hmm. uh, but your first Hearn game? Over the weekend, how did yeah. you get on? Good, yeah. Um, it was only a practice game. Um, my club is there in zone. Um, so we're a senior club and we played against uh, Corsi Rovers, who were an intermediate club. Um, we're like, yeah, I did all right. Um, we've, we've got our um, first league game now this weekend against Middleton. Uh, so that would be a bit tougher. But yeah, I really enjoyed it. It was a good crack. It wasn't, it wasn't as quick as it used to be when I was 18 or 19 and not as skillful, but still managed to to get a few scores. Any sledging going on, given your, uh, your career? Um, well, they said uh, that I was a better hurdler than a dancer, but that wouldn't be hard. But, um, so a little bit, like, but ah, it's all a bit of crack. Would you find that even in a practice game, well, obviously you've been playing now a while, but even in training maybe, that given you did represent your country and, and whatever in rugby, that maybe they might target you a little bit physically, try and uh, leave a marker? Um, yeah, so like I, when I came back from France, we came back from France in, the end of August, um, 
I was after letting myself go a little bit. Um, I went from 87, 88 kgs as a rugby player to 99 kgs after a summer in France. So I kind of, and I came back and I got a call from the lads to play in a junior, junior football team. So I was like, all right, if you're stuck, fair enough. So I came on off the bench with about five minutes to go and out of the corner of my eye. I see a fella literally from 20 yards running at me. <laughs> it's not an exaggeration. He took about 20 yard run up to give me a shoulder. So last minute I kind of braced myself, took it like, and um, yeah, so that was my welcome to junior football. He was, he was obviously trying to make a name for himself, but I just said, said to him after, what are you trying to do? I asked him a genuine question and he stood there, didn't talk to me and then just left me alone for the rest of the game. So <laughs> it's all right, but hopefully I'll have a stick to mind myself in the hurling anyway, so I'll be all right. Have you had to adapt your game given how long you've been gone from it? Uh, may maybe, um, maybe you don't quite have yeah. the pace of old. Yeah, I don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's why I had to retire from rugby, because my body was, was fucked. Excuse me. <laughs> um, so at least in hurling you can get the ball and you can, if you're within 60 metres of the goal, you have you've a fair chance of throwing it over the bar, so you don't have to run, um, which, is, which helps. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I've had to like I used to be able to run around people, but I can't do that anymore. So um, hopefully I'll rely on my hurling skills or whatever's left of them to to do all right. Uh, class is permanent, all right. You're enjoying retirement, or yeah, it's fine? it's good. Like um, like I said, I was ready to retire. I had my fill of professional rugby. Um, I probably had um, abused my body enough, um, so that's why I'm going back hurling. Um, <laughs> but. I do miss the crack of the lads and I miss the, the routine of being a professional rugby player and I guess the purpose it gives you every weekend, I miss that, but I don't miss training on a, on a Monday, Tuesday, getting young, young academy kids coming in who are coming out of school and massive. It wasn't me. Yeah, no. <laughs> it wasn't me. No, they're athletes coming out of school now. Oh, they're sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. Um, I, don't, I don't miss that. and. Um, Thankfully, I kind of achieved what I want to achieve pretty early days. I probably could have retired in 2010, to be honest with you. <laughs> Pro <laughs> probably should have, but I knocked, knocked a few extra years out of it. Like, um, so yeah, I'm I, happy to have retired, but I kind of missed the crack of the lads, right? Uh, one of the things I noticed, like going through some of your highlight reels, I suppose this has been a Six Nations so far to find by Johnny Sexton's drop goal, given we've only played France and Italy. And I was looking back at uh, some of Ronald O'Gara's Iconic drop goals, um, Grand Slam in 2009, uh, Northampton 2011. Uh, I, di I didn't spot you, Tomas, if, if I'm totally honest. Uh, you seem to, have, yeah, you seem to have missed a lot of the uh, <laughs> iconic moments. Well, see, in the, the Welsh game there, we were leading when I went off and they brought on strings, so um, then, then the Welsh ended up dominating for the last 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> and actually, these, this 39 phases, I think I carried about 16 of those and I was hitting rocks but uh, <laughs> yeah I to be fair you were bur <laughs> buried in a rock there like I was, did uh, you even see the drop goal against Northampton? I, I think I, I saw the end of it go over like so but yeah look I guess I was criticised enough for my passing like so I let, let it to the lads who could do it to do that like, so. <laughs> it's Dennis uh, Leamy I, I it is Dennis Leamy, yeah. Dennis Leamy to be fair a week after that you did Pass the ball back to Roger, and he repeated the trick down in Castro, so yeah. he didn't do too badly. Uh, why don't you have that up there? Well, I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I'm a team player. I like to let other lads have the glory too. Yeah, of course. Uh, you, I remember li literally, um, you were telling me about it there, but I remember a teacher telling me we went to the same school in Cork, and you obviously you would have uh, come across Dennis Leamy some years back, and your introduction to senior schools rugby was kind of half as a result of Dennis Leamy's impact, we'll say, for Rockwell. Yeah, exactly. Look, um, I think, I don't think, you, I don't know if it's still the case, but back in my day, it sounds sort of like a mansion, but you had to be on the pitch and contribute, actually get on the pitch to physically, to win a Senior Cup medal. Like, even if you were on the bench, you didn't get on, you wouldn't get it. Um, so it was in fourth year, I was on the bench. Frank Murphy was a scrum half. He actually played at Munster in Connacht for a good few years. He's a ref He's now, ref yeah. now yeah. yeah. So he was a scrum half. and. Conor Quaid, he played a couple of games for Munster way back. He was the out half. And obviously we were playing Rockwell in the, in the final. And Leamy and Quaid, he had a bit of, a, a bit of an altercation. <laughs> and Quaid came off the worst, obviously, with Dennis Leamy. <laughs> so I, I was brought on as a blood sub for, for our out half. And obviously we won, got the cup medal. So it's thank, thanks to Dennis Leamy's, uh, I suppose, his, his hot head um, that I got a senior cup medal because <laughs> <laughs> we ended up losing it in fifth and sixth year when I was when I was playing. So um, thankfully he had a temper and I got a senior cup medal. 
<laughs> Somebody. Some music, is that for me to dance? So. <laughs> <laughs> just just no, happened there. I'm not going to lie, we weren't told about it. Uh, <laughs> but if, if you fancy it. Uh, is it true that you made your first monster appearance at 12? Uh, no, I don't know. I've been missing four. <laughs> sources. Yeah, no. No. yeah, no. no. We, what, what are we talking now? No, no, no. I, I honestly thought, like, maybe, I don't know, was it your first? It might have been a warm up game or something that you came on. It, oh, uh, I, I, oh um, in the centre at some point, no? You could have played no. 12. No. When you smash people, you could have played 12. I, <laughs> no, my first my monster debut was. I think it was, you know, it was against, against Clentley at home. I was playing scrum half. No. Right. I, yeah. Yeah, no. this, this can be caught. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What have you made of Ireland so far in the first two games? Like, um, obviously, you know, job done against Italy. Mm. Are you optimistic going into this weekend? Yeah, I would be. I think, just in terms of what I think our defence, well, obviously, we leaked a few in the end against Italy, but generally we're a really, really good defensive side. Obviously, with, with Farrell in charge, I think it's been generally good. Um, obviously, the Welsh are going to pose a different threat, as everyone knows. They're, I suppose, they're, they're traditionally they've been a really abrasive team under Gatlin, but I guess with as the Scarlets brand of rugby is kind of filtering up into the into the national setup and they've had to, like he said himself I think this week that it's probably the strongest squad they've had in a while um, and you can see that with the changes they can make um, but I'd, I'd be pretty confident that we can make a win this weekend um, it's going to be tough like but I, uh, at home and I think our defence should be good enough and I think the lads at halfback are key like they're the best halfbacks in the world really and they dictate games and they control games, so I think those two guys would be key. Look, the Welsh halfbacks are good too, but when it comes to a tight game and their kicking game isn't as good as the, the Irish nine and ten, so I think hopefully that should get us over the line. Um, so I think we we nick it by by a score maybe. That'll do us. We'll go home. Uh, have you ever seen, have you ever seen any scrum half get as much praise for a pass from the base of a rock as Conor Murray did for a Johnny Sexton strike ball? Uh, I didn't. I don't know. I didn't. I thought Sexton got all the praise, but uh, maybe, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So no. Look, it was a good pass. Obviously, he's an unbelievable passer. He's a really good passer. But the forty-five yard drop goal was probably a bit better. It's the small. Although, although if he if he kicked the penalty earlier, he wouldn't have to do it. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Raj would have got it. Murray. <laughs> Murray, a couple of changes, or, or well, a few changes to the Irish team. I suppose the main talking point is uh, the selection of Farrell at centre instead of Robbie Henshaw. But I suppose we, we saw in in November, maybe not so much against Fiji, his first uh, test, but against Argentina, that he's capable of slotting in there, like fine pass, long pass off either hand. Uh, and for a big guy, um, well, you know, the, f the football thing is nice touch for a big man, but like he has soft hands for a big man, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. We were talking to Bernard Jackman during the week. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> <laughs> he was talking about bringing him over when he was a 12 with Ireland under 20s, but also when he first broke through. But they saw those skills, the passing game off both hands, and his footwork is really good. His skills are probably underappreciated, but we did see it in that Argentina match. Um, the little flick pass to Sexton for the, the Stockdale try. Um, the last November test so yeah he has those kind of more subtle skills I guess the really testing thing for any 13 coming into a big test match like this is defensively uh, he does make good reads but I don't think he probably has the kind of explosive pace that someone like Gary Ringrose or or maybe Jared Payne just off the mark has so I'd say Wales will certainly look at him on, on set piece just to test him out early on I wouldn't have too many worries about him to be honest um, I think for Ireland the bigger concern probably is, is tight head prop losing tight furlong one of the best players in the world, so any team is going to suffer by losing him, but Andrew Porter just isn't tested at this level. It's going to be his fifth game uh, as a starting professional tight head, so it is a big concern. Um, he's moved over since last season. He's, he's done really well. Every test he's had so far, he, he's passed. Looked really good against Italy, but against the Scarlets front row that has played together so often, know each other really well, I think you're going to see them go after him and, and look for penalties in, in, at scrum time. So I guess that's the big one for Ireland. The, the second row losing Henderson is, is a blow, just his dynamic pair around the pitch, but that is a pretty uh, solid second row pairing. James Ryan is certainly an explosive young player, uh, did really well against France uh, with his tackling technique, brilliant, and his carrying was excellent as well. And Devon Toner is always delivered for Joe Schmidt. Um, he's actually carried well this season, good in the line out, hits his rocks, uh, gets big numbers there. So there's a bit of balance there. Um, 
but you've definitely lost something with those players. Robbie Henshaw's out as well, a like huge defensive leader. So I think Joe Schmidt is probably trying to pull a bit of pressure off himself today and talking about losing those players. As you say, they still have the best halfbacks in the competition, so there's enough there to still do it, but definitely I think the confidence has taken a little blow with those changes. Um, you'd obviously be very familiar with Chris Farrell, and what have you made of his um, outings for Monster this season? Yeah, he's been he's been good with good like I suppose at the start initially he was probably more solid than spectacular but I guess he was betting in with new structures um, maybe a different way of playing than Grenoble did in in France um, and I guess Munster were getting used to him and maybe uh, I didn't appreciate his strengths and I know they're starting to utilise them um, as Murray said you know he showed in, against Argentina that he had that subtlety as well as the ability to just go forward so. Um, I think he's been a very good signing for, for Munster. Um, obviously, I think Henshaw would probably have been standout, one of the standout players with Leinster, Leinster and, and Ireland this year, so he's going to be a massive loss. Um, but I'd, be, I'd have no worries about, about Farrell stepping in and, and doing a very good job. So I think midfield Ireland will be good, good tomorrow. Um, it's just when you look at the bench, I suppose, the likes of Quinn Rue, he's probably untested at this, this level. If there is an early injury in the second row, or um, if, if, if there's an injury in the back row, obviously Pete can cover open side as well. Um, I suppose Conan's more of an eight, so it's there your, your concern is on the bench if there's a couple of early injuries, in the, particularly in the pack, that um, you might be a bit worried for Ireland, but um, no worries with, with Farrell in the centre. I think it was yourself who spoke with Bernard Jackman about Farrell, wasn't yeah. it? And, and he mentioned that like you don't to be a good defender, you don't necessarily need to be coming in and making these gargantuan hits. Like You yeah. can shape yourself to or you can more so shape what the attacking team sees in a way and, yeah, and almost can, steer them in a direction. Yeah, discourage them to come down your channel, steer them back in. Like, you know, if you're reading that wide attack, just get up ahead of the line and close off that option or make it a really risky long pass over the top, potential for an intercept. He is an intelligent player like that. Um, we should also point out that he's an unbelievable athlete. Like, he's 6'4", 110 kgs, mm. really powerful in contact. So that makes a massive difference at this level. You can talk up all, all his subtle skills how much chance is he really going to have to, to use them against a, an unbelievably aggressive Welsh line speed defence? Probably not as much, but he's well able in contact. He probably wasn't at his best against Fiji, but even in contact in that game, he did really well in, in heavy traffic. So I think he'll probably get some direct carries earlier on and, and use them in that way. The Welsh midfield has been strong with, with Parks and Scott Williams, and they're pretty physical guys as well, but I think he's well able for it. Is there an argument you made that, I suppose with, with Robbie Henshaw, not so much at 13 admittedly, but when he was 12, I, it was like, you know, he was a bludgeon or he was used as such when we would have seen him at fullback at Connacht a couple of years ago, uh, breaking lines constantly and things like that. And maybe that had started to, uh, to happen again from a 13, but is there an argument you made that Farrell might be a little bit more explosive going down the 13 channel with ball in hand, even allowing for Wales's line speed? Yeah, I don't think either of them really has that outside break really, uh, Henshaw didn't really have that either, but he did seem to be enjoying definitely back in 13, um, well I know he was enjoying it, just having a little bit more freedom to be creative, not to have to carry directly every time, like he does that job so well that it's hard not to use him that way, even his little bit of footwork before the contact and then his kind of explosive fend or just using his elbow or his forearm just to block guys, um, he's really good in that role, but he was enjoying having that bit more freedom, massive defensive leader, like his work rate is off the charts, just covering for guys, keeping alive, like hunting from the inside. So it's definitely a blow for Ireland's defensive system. And like realistically, they're down to what? Their fourth choice, 13. So it's a real test for that depth, which Joe Schmidt has been talking up a lot since, the, since last year, really. You know, that was their big goal from 2015 World Cup to, to build depth in, across the board. So here's a test for it. Let's see if they really have built that depth. And do you reckon that looking at Ireland's bench, there are still impact players? I mean. You look, Fergus McFadden gets a lot of stick, but obviously he's he gets a lot fine, of stick. too much stick. But he's obviously playing some fine rugby. I, I suppose though the argument might be that he's not quite. Um, maybe he's not the game. He's, he's not the he's not <laughs> Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's having a superb season. He's, he's. I've seen him stepping guys. I've seen him step Jacob Stockdale. His speed times are as good as any winger. We speak to the guys in Leinster. Um, I don't know. I think there's probably a perception around him, and people aren't really willing to see beyond that. He, he's seen as just a a very solid player, which he is. He's a really good defensive reader. Um, he's really reliable. He doesn't make errors. And for Joe Schmidt as a coach, that, may, that counts for a lot. Um, I think he's probably maligned unfairly, though, a lot of the time, really. Yeah, what, what do you make of that? Like, uh, there yeah. are a couple of players, like Rob Kearney is another one that kind of springs to mind, where 
they just get seem to get undue criticism. Like. Yeah, look, perception does become reality, and if I suppose you give a dog a name, it sticks like and. I guess we have to blame journalists like this fella for that. <laughs> <laughs> I've never enough for example. He's only a blogger. <laughs> I'm just a blogger. Um, yeah. No, look. Obviously, I think if you're looking at best back trees in in, in Ireland at the moment, obviously Zeebs has to be in in the mix. Like, but you know, Rob Kearney has never probably let Ireland or Leinster down, and he's he's had a phenomenal career and he's still still going strong. So you can't criticise his selection. Likewise with, uh, with McFadden, like he's had an unbelievable season this year, and he has the bonus of covering centre as well and goal kicking if he has to. So um, and he's like his form has dictated that he's in, in the mix. So you can't criticise any selections, but obviously everyone has their opinions. And some people, well, monster fans think Zebo should be there and um, probably should be, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't need that for session. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not biased at all. <laughs> Obviously, uh, some huge names coming back for Wales as well. Um, yeah. You mentioned to me actually beforehand how Gatlin likes to target the opposition's strengths in the way and to have Dan Bigger back firstly, probably aerially bombarding Ireland, um, to have Liam Williams back, a really explosive player, and uh, who the hell is the other one? Lee Halfpenny yeah, as well yeah. at 15. Like it's, um, uh, my interpretation of the performance against England was that like they performed reasonably well but it just seemed like there were so many new names and new combinations that maybe the final ball just wasn't sticking but when you've got three really influential players like this back there is a fear that they might just properly click isn't there yeah it'll be interesting to, i think dan bigger at 10 is, is a really interesting one I, I actually think ireland would be um looking at him as a bit of an opportunity he's obviously highly experienced he's proven himself in these kind of big games before as have the other two guys come back in but he hasn't played for five weeks He's kind of been rushed back from his shoulder injury. Uh, he hasn't really played as much in that scarlet system. The, the kind of We're going to actually look at their attack a little bit later. Um, he hasn't played in that system as much. Is it going to be as fluid? I think Ireland's back row, I think their centres will see Dan Baker as an opportunity to really get up in his face, you know, get in his head. They're talking about targeting Sexton, but you can have no doubt that Ireland are going after Dan Bigger just back from, from a shoulder injury. Um, like he does add a lot to that aerial game. You talk about targeting strengths, and Wales do tend to do that. I think of 2015 in Cardiff um, when they beat when they beat Ireland, they went after him in the air early on. Like you know, go after Ireland's main strength, beat them there, and the momentum you get from that, the psychological boost is unbelievable. Uh, so Dan Bigger was key. Halfpenny was going up in the air um, and actually beating guys like Carney. It happened from the very first kickoff. So I actually think they'll they'll try and test Ireland in that area. A lot of teams try and avoid that really against Ireland, but those three guys, particularly Halfpenny and Bigger, are really strong in that department. And as well. Defensively, like England got massive gains with their kicking game against the Welsh. Um, I don't think it was probably appreciated enough. Like on a wet, scrappy day, just keeping them in their half is massively valuable. They also got the try from Patchell, who's gone completely now, um, from his error in the air, and, and, and Farrell kicks it through. So that was a massive area in the, in the last game. I think um, that Gatlin has really kind of shored that up now. Tomás, like given that uh, Bigger is coming back from a shoulder injury, is, is it a conversation that takes place? It's like, let's go after this guy, particularly on this side where he might be a little bit susceptible to, to give. I don't think you can uh, direct, <laughs> <laughs> say, look, I'm going to pass you the ball here and you can run exactly at this side because obviously the defence is moving, like you're dependent on the pass. But like, I guess most teams, traditionally, the 12 is a better tackler than the 10. So. You, most teams will always test test a ten, irrespective of whether he's got a shoulder injury or not. And even if he's fully fit, or well, he's obviously fit now if he's if he's playing international rugby. But yeah, he'll be tested definitely. Um, I can guarantee that Sexton will have Aki on a hard ball. You know, with, with his wraparound move, they always have that option for, to hit the, hit the man up in a, a hard option. And Chris Farrell or Bundy Aki will be definitely going down his channel early doors. Um, but you do that for every ten, irrespective of whether to come back from injury. So yeah, like Sexton will be, there'll be a pre pre call move that you can guarantee that one of the centres will be going straight straight over the top of him, and he can choose to tackle with whatever shoulder he wants. But <laughs> um, he won't have much time to, to change sides. So yeah, it's going to happen. But it's a conversation that's had, and look, you target every ten. Maria, you're going to have a look at Wales' defence to begin with before we get to the attack in the second half. Yeah, like this has probably been the issue for Ireland, hasn't it? Uh, the last couple of years, they've really struggled to score tries. They have created a couple of line breaks, but um, I think they've struggled against the Welsh defence, as do a lot of teams. You know, you saw it in, against England as well, really disciplined, 
gave up only two penalties despite defending for long periods. Um, and they're really comfortable defending for long periods. Uh, their line speed is, is massive. Sean Edwards has always put a massive emphasis on this. So they're here against Scotland. You can see them up. Uh, coming off the touchline in particular is a, re is a really kind of dangerous time ag against the Welsh. You see Finn Russell has to go back inside and Scotland are going to set up again and try and go again off that edge. Um, I think Ireland will have learned lessons from this. Uh, don't leave the ball in the air for a long time. Uh, Ali Price takes an extra step. You see Gareth Davies getting up off the line. Like in those situations you have to just be like Ireland will be, people complain about Ireland being direct, but you just got to be direct there or get your 10 on the ball and get him to link to that first forward, uh, forward carrying pod. In this instance, the ball is just in the air for too long. That massive line speed from Wales uh, comes up and they get an intercept try. Um, you know, they stack the front line with, with bodies. You know, there's often 13, often even 14, and they just leave one in the backfield here. You can see the width they've got in their defensive line there. Um, and again, coming forward at line speed, they're looking for those big double tackles. You know, they want a two-on-one hit every time, dominate the collision, slow the ball even before it gets to the ground. But by putting so many bodies in the line, you are leaving spaces elsewhere. We've seen Johnny Sexton already with his cross kicks, his kick passes. He's going to pick out those spaces. Um, and it's all about that decision making. You know, this time they have just a couple of guys in the backfield. So that space is on. You see here that Finn Russell actually goes to it. The kick quality, probably not great. It's probably in the air for too long. But you just see that space that's there um, for, for, for Scotland rather to go after. On this occasion then, the Welsh kind of change up their defensive system and they drop the nine just in there. Uh, Gareth Davies goes into sweep. So, Now's your chance, you know, how's, what's your decision maker seeing? He's seen a nine in the back line, two in the backfield. So now's your chance to go to that edge and actually run your kind of attacking play to the, to the outside edge. Scotland, some good hands. They get to the outside channel. They're able to kick a head down. Uh, Lee Halfany then comes across late and they're able to smash him over the try line. <clears throat> so it's just about reading that, that defensive setup because Wales do tend to shift a little bit. Sometimes they'll have one back. So there's your cross field kick or put it onto the grass and bounce in his touch. If the sweeper is in there, maybe you have a chance to go to the width. And you mentioned how important Sex and Murray are. They're really good decision makers, so that's a huge advantage for Ireland against that unbelievable defensive line speed. It was interesting to see what England did. They went extremely narrow in the second half. We're going to see a, a kind of series of pick and goes. Uh, essentially, you're just trying to take some bodies out of that front line because there's so many guys up on your feet uh, that you're getting massive double tackles all the time. Uh, here they go very direct around the rook. I think we're definitely going to see this again from Ireland. Again, people kind of moan at this style of play, but you've got to sap bodies out of the defensive line uh, to create that opportunity. So pick and go, short runners off nine, Conor Murray coming in the arc, carrying himself, and then eventually that creates the space out wide. You see here, if this pass goes to hand, sorry, I'll just pause it here. There's three guys on the outside against a two. Uh, there's three there, and two defenders just here and here. They do have someone coming across on that sweeping line, but it is a chance for England. They, they created those chances quite regularly, but their execution on, on a Poor, like it was really tough, the, the conditions. I don't think it was evident enough on TV, uh, but they just couldn't take those opportunities. Um, and like Wales are so comfortable getting to 20, 30 phases on attack. If you, if you think back to 2015 in Cardiff, there was one passage with 32 phases. Ireland get a penalty, 10 more phases, and then Johnny Sexton goes off his feet. But they just love defending. They'll, they'll work all day. And it's going to take something a little bit extra from Ireland this time to, to break them down. Uh, in this example from England, this is phase 25, Owen Farrell, like one of the players of the championship so, f championship so far, he gets on the ball just after carrying and takes kind of a risky bridge pass just over the top of the edge there and then also an unbelievable offload from Launchbury. But that's after 25 phases of battering, battering, battering um, and it takes that something extra from, from, from the, the English guys to break them down. From Ireland's point of view, like that's the big issue in the 22, can they convert pressure? They've always had it against Wales. Um, and the most encouraging thing against Italy, like it's easy to write this off, but in terms of Ireland's development over the last two, three years, it's been the use of forwards as those link passers. Um, and especially close to the try line where it's so hard to get that extra meter. Like you probably know yourself, diving for the try line, getting smashed by three guys around the rook. Um, and here you see Stander having a go, and then they're going to pick and jam with, with Jack McGrath uh, and Porter on his shoulder, Omani coming around. And Again, you've probably seen so many times where Ireland have carried in this position. Dev Toner probably getting on the ball and just trucking it up. But this time, he just turns and he goes out the back door to Carberry. Um, and Ireland have this nice shape set up. Like, it's not too intricate. Uh, it's nothing revolutionary, but it is a forward making a decision on the ball, obviously with a call out the back um, and going the back door to Carberry. Then you get Bundyaki running that hard line to the outside of that defender, Stockdale coming around uh, to accept the pass behind him, and they go in for the try. 
like that's encouraging to see from Ireland so close to the try line. Yes, it's against Italy, and the challenge is can they do that against like unbelievably organised, aggressive defence from guys who love making tackles. Uh, interestingly enough, the Welsh themselves have kind of set the stall out in this regard. Uh, you see them here, they make a one-out carry, and then in a similar situation, it's Corey Hill here in the middle of the pod. Corey Hill was having an unbelievable championship after being completely slagged off during the Lions tour. I'll put my hand up. <laughs> uh, but he's been brilliant, but he turns and he just released that ball at the back and they've held their width. Like it's so hard to break defences down in, in those last couple of metres. Um, and I think Wales probably show Ireland how to do it there, but can Ireland do it against the Welsh defence? That's a, a big question. They've developed that aspect of their game, but um, it'll be interesting to see if they can actually do it now on, on Saturday. Yeah, is that, is that something, Tomás, that even predates Gatlin's reign as way as coach? Because like, even if you go back to the Grand Slam game, like Ireland's tries, it took ferocious work to get up to the line for O'Driscoll to go over from half a yard. And then it was a kind of a moment of magic. It, as Murray kind of mentions there, uh, Tommy Bowles' try comes from a kick that kind of splits the Welsh defence in the end. And it wasn't necessarily like line breaks or anything like that. Yeah, I guess um, <clears throat> it just shows how, how tough it is to make line breaks at the top level of international rugby. Um, defenses are like Murray said there. Like um, Sean Edward liked to load the front front of the front of the pitch, and he lets a lot of the work to his full back to cover the whole pitch. Obviously, that's where the half back's kicking comes into it. And but a lot of it's down to analysis. Even like Tommy Bowes' cross field kick that was from a midfield scrum. And even 2009, we had analysed that the wingers shoot up from midfield scrums. So what you say it may have been a lucky bounce, but it was preordained. So. You can guarantee Schmidt will have five, six preordained plays, whether it's first, second phase, where maybe he throws in a kick or whatever he does, but they'll obviously have done the analysis of where the back three will be or whatever. So a lot of it's down to analysis because the defences are so, are so stru structured and preordained that you have to almost predict what they're going to do and then try and throw something in. But um, it's just so hard to break down defensive at top level rugby. Um, and that's why attacking rugby I know we all we all look I want Ireland to attack more and probably kick less or um, spread the ball more but they don't do it because it's not easy to do it so um, and that's why you see you can run in tries against Italy but you can't run them in against the top team so easily but um, yeah look it's going to be difficult but I think this Irish team because Sexton and Murray are so good at manipulating defences and Sexton has I suppose a repertoire of being able to kick a ball run a ball um, I suppose you utilise Von Diakey and Chris Farrell up the middle and you have to take him on up in the middle you have to take him on with an abrasive game first as well and soften it up so it's just not easy to break defences down is, is, is my question and I've given a long-winded answer and you're probably sick of listening to me now but yeah. Like the last time Ireland had a really successful performance against Wales was 2014 Joe Schmidt's first year um, and the game plan was direct a lot of kicking in behind those wings who, who are up high like Lee Halfpenny's positioning is unbelievable, but if he's in back there on his yeah. own, like really push him and test him out. And also the Irish mole was massive. We actually haven't seen the mole really in this championship. I wonder if Ireland are holding that back a little bit to, to spring in this match because I think we're going to see a lot of kicking over that unbelievable line speed. Like England just said, we can't, we can't actually skirt them here. We're, like two passes were either going to get inter intercepted or smashed. Let's kick it. They kicked 39 times. And when they did attack, it was very direct around the fringes of the rock where the line speed can't really get going. So, like, yeah, it's laudable to try and go to the width against the Welsh, but you massively have to earn it by going through the middle first or just kick over them. It's just a safer option. It's a, a more error-free option. Sweet. We'll uh, call that half-time, guys. We will take your questions in the second half, and uh, we'll have more from Tomás and Murray as well. Cheers. We're not missing anybody, are we? Nobody in the jacks or. <laughs> That's fair enough. Like sometimes there's always good, like there's always a bad friend who'd be like, nah, fuck it, just keep going. <laughs> to also, like I was just saying to you there, looking back over the last few games between Ireland and, and Wales, uh, the last ten we won only three of them, you know, and, and it's been. Very often when the margins have been tight, they've been shaded red as opposed to green. Like going back to your own career, I think you would have played them six or seven times in, in your Ireland career and Wales won four of those and, and Ireland three. And I think um, even if you look at the, the our three wins in the last ten, one was a World Cup warm-up as well. They hate us, do they? <laughs> um, I think obviously there's a bit of uh, bad blood between Gatlin and the Union like um, from 
from when he departed, like, but I guess it's just like any rivalry, kind of, if you play a team enough and there's that intense rivalry, it kind of, and it's magnified, you know, through the head coach, like, he's not afraid to, to say what he, what, he, what he believes and he doesn't sugarcoat things, so, and then obviously he, he dropped Brian O'Driscoll in the Lions tour, obviously that <laughs> got, on, got on a few people's uh, <laughs> nerves, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, he was proven. Who led in the Welshman? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, look, games have been pretty. I think the home advantage hasn't. I think the away team has done better than the home team in the last 10, 12 games. I was reading somewhere, you know, the last couple of days. So, well, that doesn't go well, does it? But um, <laughs> no, I think it's just because two, the two teams, like obviously Wales, have had a recent in recent history have done really well in the Six Nations. As have Ireland under Joe Schmidt. England have gotten good again and under under um, Jones the last couple of years but it's because those two teams those two nations have been successful in winning titles over the last 10 years that there's a genuine comp competition and you know you the top teams like France have disappeared off the radar they're not a top team anymore in the Six Nations even like so they're not the biggest game any longer like the so the English game is always going to be big because it's England and then Wales are one of the top teams always so as a player coming into it, you target the best teams and vice versa, they're going to target Ireland because Ireland are one of the best teams in the world now, so that's why there's probably bad blood. I'd say they probably look at it as well, like Ireland winning 2014, 2015, beating the All Blacks. They probably look at that and go, like, that should be us, we're just as talented as them. Um, and in fairness to Gallon, like, he, he's, well, he's 100 tests in now, he's, he's done a great job, like, he's, he loves getting written off, he thrives under those circumstances, like, went with the Lions in the summer, um, written off like there's going to be a 3-0 whitewash comes out of it pretty smug in fairness to him but uh, <laughs> comes out of it with a draw yeah. like with Wales they're constantly written off and he, he loves it he's a great motivator interesting enough in current house this week the Ireland coaches haven't really mentioned him once uh, they keep talking about Rob Howley and the great job Rob Howley is doing <laughs> uh, the great job Sean Edwards is doing uh, so I, I think they're kind of subtly giving, giving him a bit of a dig there uh, but he's had his own little barbs as well talking about Ireland just winning by grinding teams down looking for penalties um, and that stuff probably gets to Joe Schmidt a little bit as well. But yeah, it's heated up nicely, the rivalry. I think there's going to be a, a nice bit of bite to it on, on Saturday. Yeah, but even Gareth Davis talking about bonus point wins for Wales. Like, yeah. they're, uh, they've always been a confident team, whether they had a right to <laughs> yeah. be or not. Like, but it, they do have a right to be confident this yeah. weekend. Well, that's Welsh rugby. Like, they're, they're a massive rugby nation. Like, the stuff they've achieved down through the years has been incredible. Uh, they've given us some of the best rugby players of all time, some of the greatest like uh, Lions and, and Barbarians of all time, um, and they they feel they are a to top top nation. They feel that they probably haven't achieved as much as they should have in the last couple of years. Um, and as I said, they look at Ireland and say that should be us. Uh, you're going to look at the Welsh attack now, or uh, yeah, we're going to look at the attack. Um, attack sorry. Like obviously, everyone's been talking about the Welsh attack, uh, and it's been really impressive. Um, again, actually, in fairness, Rob Howley, he has been driving this, he's the attack coach, um, and Gallon's given him a lot of responsibility. Um, and we're just going to kind of look at some of the characteristics, some of the stuff that they've been doing since last year, actually, when Howley was in charge before, um, before the Lions tour. He kind of brought in a new shape to their attack, um, and they've, they've got this scarlet kind of mentality. The forwards are all capable of, of ball handling. Just in terms of the shape and face play, uh, they're playing that 1-3-3-1 system, just setting themselves up with nice width across the pitch. Like I'm, I'm sure people probably know what that is, but just in case they don't, you have one forward there in the ruck, he's in the 15 meter channel. You've got three forwards here, the next pod. Uh, they can either carry or go out the back door to this player holding in behind them. Then you've got another pod of three forwards there, and then you've got one of the loose forwards in the wide channel. That's why you always see Navidi or Shingler kind of in that area of the pitch. Uh, that's their shape and attack. So as soon as it goes into phase play, they're trying to find that shape. And within that, then you can make your decisions on the ball. Uh, you can pass out the back door as they do here. Ken Owens goes out the back to one of their playmakers, Scott Williams, who finds uh, you know one, another one of the forwards in that in that second pot of three. Out they go to Navidi, and um, they don't make a line break here, but it's just to kind of highlight that shape and the fact that the forwards are passing. Another element is turnover attack. Like people probably heard Rob Howley talking about chaos on the Lions tour. I hate that phrase, but it kind of sums it up. You know, it's unstructured play. Um, and that's a massive focus for Wales. They get a turnover off a of Finn Russell pass here and they strike for a try straight away. Uh, they've been really good at this. If you think of that Scott Williams near try when, when Sam Underhill tackled them, that actually came off kick return. So they're getting really good chances off, off their uh, unstructured play. There's the hooker, sub-hooker, uh, Elliot D making a pass. 
halfpenny links, then Shingler makes a good decision in midfield, he's comfortable on the ball, gets an offload again, Navidi's comfortable on the ball, and then the backs are able to finish, Hadley Parks does a really good job. Um, but you have everyone in the team comfortable on the ball, uh, uh, handling the ball. Uh, Ireland's uh, kind of big job is putting pressure on those skills, um, and we're going to look at that. One other thing to highlight is Dan Bigger being back. Uh, his attacking kicking game is really strong. We see a good example against South Africa here in November. Uh, a, a nice low crossfield kick. We saw Russell's one earlier on, probably in the air for too long. Uh, but this gives his winger a chance to, to kind of go on the inside, beat his man, offload, and a try just from one attacking kick. I think Ireland are really aware of this, and especially with Jacob Stockdale there in the left wing, he hasn't really been tested by any team yet. He's very inexperienced, um, but no one's really gone after him. He's a big guy, obviously strong, good leap. But I think positionally and in terms of his de defensive decision making, he's still learning a lot. I think Rob Kearney is, is guiding him around the pitch a lot. So I think Wales' attacking kicking game uh, will kind of try and pick him out a little bit. We see another example here, uh, Dan Bigger with that little chip in behind. Um, and this is probably a pertinent example because uh, if we just freeze it on a little bit, that um, the left wing for South Africa, he's actually, he should be further across the pitch. And I think they're the kind of opportunities that Wales will look for against Stockdale. Great pickup from Parks. Um, so they have that element of attack and kicking to, to their attack as well. Reese Patchell here, another example finally against uh, England. This was the disallowed try. Uh, obviously should have been allowed. Yeah, it was a try. Uh, <laughs> uh, but again, an attack and kick in the 22. Um, but what we saw England do was, uh, as we said, put those skills under pressure. You know, it's all well and good doing against Scotland. Their, their line speed was really poor, they were passive. But here you get England coming up, and even though Alan Wynne Jones gets the ball away here, you know, Toja gets a shot on him, Dan Cole there gets a shot on Patchell, and then the next couple of defenders are, are closing up that space, uh, putting pressure on it, trying to get a double tackle, slow it down, and on the next phase again, there's line speed from England. Uh, Itoje, we can't actually hear it here, but you can hear it on the ref mic, he smashes him in, in the tackle. So you're just trying to get that line speed onto those pods of forwards, um, and just be combative, you know, like there's Owen Farrell, uh, standing out as a pillar position, what can he do to make it scrappy? Just a little counter rook, force to knock on. Uh, don't let Wales get into that momentum where they're using that one three three one shape um, and, and cutting it apart. Again, the line speed here, chop down Will, Win jo uh, Alan Wynne Jones before he can get that pass in. And then even now, when you've actually got a bit of a, a chance there for Wales on the edge, again, they bring that line speed. Um, and that's probably been an issue for Ireland. We talk about them getting narrow, you think back to Argentina. They were narrow, but Part of the problem was you were missing guys to lead that line speed and, and actually force the attackers to really put their skills under under massive pressure and make those decisions. So I think that's the key thing for Ireland is get that line speed against those pods of three so that even if they're going to pull that pass, you're, you're filtering through and getting to that playmaker in behind. One thing to note as well is that Wales actually like to kick the ball a lot. It probably hasn't got much tension. 39 kicks against England in bad conditions, but also 34 against Scotland as well. And as we said, they're probably going to go and look to, to take a strength from Ireland it's Lee Halfpenny here in 2015 going up over um, Conor Murray and winning the ball. Again, that's a massive kind of psychological boost against a team who prides themselves in, in that area. Um, and our final just example is um, just Wales attack from deep. They're, they're buzzing with confidence now. They have real belief in their, in their attacking play. Gareth Davies says they're coming for a bonus point and they genuinely believe they're good enough to do that. Um, they're set up here for, for a box kick. You know, they shape to, to clear their lines, but they've also got that option to go to width and you can see how disorganised the Scots are, like completely disjointed in defence, they're not expecting it. Um, Wales again, good handling uh, from Williams, puts Parks, who's been really impressive, away up, up, up the left. And as they come back, we're going to see that shape again, they find it really quickly. So you've got one of the forwards in there, you've got your first pod of three here, another pod of three here, and then one of the forwards in the wide channel. So they're finding that shape really well. Um, and they're slipping into it really comfortably. In this instance, it's a really bad read from the Scottish defence. But because that shape is there, there's a lot of decisions for that defender to make. Um, and Pacho's able to put Shingler into a hole. He's been really impressive. He's, he's thriving in this. His work rate's gone up. You see Corey Hill on the ball, Rob Evans on the ball, Alan Wynne Jones, the pass just doesn't go to hand. Um, but, but the forwards are they're thriving in that system. Uh, and, and they've got those skills. Like Alan Wynne Jones actually has kind of been rejuvenated by it. Um, so they're the things that Ireland need to look to shut down. Uh, I guess the, the challenge for Wales is it looks great against Scotland, but against England we didn't really see it as much. You know, they, they, they kind of relied on those unstructured situations more, more to, to create the chances, but certainly they're coming with new strengths uh, this weekend. You mentioned how potent they are from uh, kick returns. Is there, like, do they lose a little bit of that danger replacing Gareth Anscombe with Lee Halfpenny particularly? Well, 
the modern Lee Halfpenny, I suppose, more so than the one we saw in 2013, who was an explosive counter-attacker in his own right. Yeah, I, they absolutely do. And I think, like, we're looking at the strengths there. I think we're going to see probably a tailored version of this against Ireland. I think they're aware enough that the Irish defence, as you mentioned, it's a really strong system. Ireland now have a lot of bodies in the front line. Um, and they're not going to be able to do as much of that. They're not going to be able to get those passes to the width every time because Ireland are looking now to score tries off their defence. And you saw it against Italy, a couple of interceptions and they streak away for tries. So I think they'll reel it in a little bit. And obviously the personnel changed that. We've talked about Bigger. Can he fit into that system as intuitively half Benny? Is he as comfortable on the ball? Not really, like Hanscom is. So yeah, that does kind of change it a bit. But they've gone for this philosophy and I think they're, they're going to double down on it now. Tomas, it sounds slightly worrying. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Well, Tomas doesn't care for the Welsh at all. <coughs> I guess Murray said there, like, they were obviously impressive against Scotland, but against a better, better defensive team like England, they didn't look as potent. So I think Ireland will be better defensively um, than Scotland. Um, and I suppose the selection of Halfpenny kind of tips towards the defensive side of things. Obviously, his positional play is good. They like to get the 15 to cover the whole backfield. He's good at that. Um, obviously, Williams is a big at attacking threat, but he's good defensively in the air too. And they've George North to come on off the bench if they do need an attacking threat. But um, yeah, like it's it's about like I remember Connacht when they were successful in their land, they played that structure, and they became very good at it. But at international level, that pot at three, especially the ball player in the middle, he doesn't have as much time to make a decision and. You're going to see Ireland's line speed putting him under pressure to make a decision. So even the tip on pass is going to be more difficult for him. Or the ball out the back to the to the ten or to the back, whoever it is, is going to be more difficult for him to to give. So um, you're going to see Ireland put big line speed on that pot of tree and make sure that he has no time in the ball. And you'll see if Ireland are being successful with their line speed, you'll see him tuck the ball and take it into contact, and that'll be a sign that Ireland are on top defensively. Whereas if he's getting a chance to put the tip on or put the ball at the back, then Ireland's lead speed is off, obviously not, not where it should be. So that's going to be a big in indication of whether Ireland are, are on top defensively. So no, I'd be, I wouldn't be unduly worried about it, but it's, they have a bit better attacking threat than they had last year, definitely. What have you made of Gareth Davies there? Because Webb being out was kind of portrayed as a big blow for them. What have you made of Davies? Yeah, yeah I, I think, look, even, even when Webb was starting and you know, the occasional time where they, they bought Davies in, he's been very impressive. He has an unbelievable uh, uh, knack of getting over for tries as well. Um, his support lanes are really good. Yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan of him. I just think in this type of game, hopefully it's, it's I think it's going to be a tight game. His kicking game isn't isn't as good as Murray's. He's yeah. not able to control the game. He's as he's more of a running running nine, likes, likes to get a tempo of the game up, which he's good at. Um, and if Wales do get into multi phase then you'll see him come into, into his own. I think he's an extremely dangerous player. But from Irish point of view, I think we've better controlling half-backs, as I said, but yeah, I think he's a very impressive nine. I think he's probably better than Webb. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Certainly where they're trying to play. I don't know if you have that slide on Luke with the ball and play time, but like lifting that tempo was a big yeah. thing for Wales. Yeah. They've always backed their fitness. They think they're fitter than anyone. You know, I remember them, they were the first ones going to Spala for those yeah. cryotherapy. They, you know, he's, Gallen was one of the first coaches to bring in that kind of conditioning where they get fitter through the season. Um, and these fixtures, like there's the numbers, they've had unbelievable amounts of ball in play time. So 2015, 40, nearly 44 minutes when the average in the championship was 36 minutes. 2016, almost 43 minutes, again, 36 minute average. And last year, like 47 minutes, 28 seconds is a massive amount of ball in play time. Um, and there's two things there. There's Wales looking to keep it on, on the pitch with their kicking game because they think we're fit or we can defend for 25, 26 phases. And there's also the fact that Ireland, in attack, like to build phases for, for kind of building pressure and uh, probably winning penalties. So that's been a massive element in the last couple of years. And, and the kind of attritional side of the game has, has been a huge element of injuries. Um, who can actually last those 25, 26, even 30 phases and, and who cracks in those massive um, long passages of play. So I think we can probably expect something similar again. Uh, we'll take a couple of your own questions if you have them. I know some of you were talking about it at the interval there, uh, including a man down from Donegal, fair play to you. Uh, <laughs> we are giving away a pair of tickets as well, by the way, to uh, do the big game this weekend. So the best question at the end, uh, we might get yourself Tomas to pick it if you don't mind. And uh, the winner will get a pair of tickets to the game. So anybody to kick us off there? 
Hello, um, so I'm the Donny Gall guy. Was oh. ah, <laughs> give, this man, give this man a round of applause. <laughs> uh, well done. So, so just kind of from uh, speaking to a few people around the bar, um, it seemed like I don't know, it's nearly a, a question for the audience. I might be the only Ulster fan here. <laughs> Some of you are a bit reluctant over there. But, um, <laughs> um, I think maybe um, it kind of reflects on, you know, uh, some parts of Ireland are very underrepresented in uh, in rugby. I mean, I, as far as I know, the last Donegal man to play Test rugby was Dave Gallagher, who captained the All Blacks in like 1904 or something. <laughs> um, oh, he's originally a sheep farmer from Donegal, but. Uh, does anybody in the, in the audience or on the panel have any opinions on, you know, should the uh, IRFU be casting the, the net a bit wider? Um, I mean, I always kind of supported Ulster, but I only really started going to games when I was in college in Belfast, and Ravenhall seems a, a long way from, from Donegal, so, you know, is there anything can be done to, to get more people involved and, you know, unearth a few... I, I know Michael Murphy went to Claremont there for that toughest trade. <laughs> um, didn't, didn't really disgrace himself, but I know even from the Donegal senior panel, I think Paddy McBurdy probably could play anywhere in the, the back three. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's interesting that the RFU have actually, uh, they've obviously discussed this quite a bit. Like, you know, you're seeing more guys like Ty Furlan coming from Wexford, like Jack O'Donoghue from Waterford is Captain Munster now. Um, they have put a bit of focus on it. They've got four provincial talent coaches, they're called. So those guys' job is to go out to non-traditional schools um, and clubs um, and kind of encourage players to, to get onto the pathway. Um, we probably won't see that the results of that for maybe four or five years, but certainly some of those players are coming into the, the underage representative teams now. Um, again, yeah, we'll probably have to be patient with it, but it's a great point. Like, there, How many more tight furlongs are there out there? Possibly not many world-class tight heads, but... Uh, there's definitely guys with ability, as you say, crossover athletes, um, and actually they've started running uh, sevens competitions in kind of traditionally GAA schools. Uh, that's also being rolled out at the moment. So, you know, as you say, a guy who could be a midfielder in GAA uh, gets a taste for sevens, which is very accessible, very fun to play, and he goes, hang on, I actually have a chance to play rugby here. I, I was just chatting to you before, and it's, it's about getting that opportunity to play. So, um, I think that has been a focus for the RFU. I think they probably still can do more work on it, but. Uh, it'll only strengthen the kind of playing pool, uh, which is a massive, a massive aim for them. That's probably more of an issue for Ulster. Um, I know in Munster they definitely do target talented GA players from 15, 16. Sorry. 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 I, I, I genuinely didn't mean that, but uh, like you look at look at Sweetenham. Um, he he played Cork Senior Hurling like for two years and. Obviously, then he was offered a gig in the academy. He was obviously a talented rugby player, but he had played in Bandon, Bandon his school, and probably hadn't hadn't had a whole pile of experience coaching wise. So he was very much a project for Munster Rugby, and every year in, for the first three years, he got very limited game time with Munster. He was obviously exposed to professional training day in day out, but the Cork senior herders kept coming back to try and get him year in year out, and. I know he was getting frustrated with his lack of game time and he was severely tempted to go back to the GAA. Mm. But I guess Munster persisted with him and he persisted to be fair to him. And he's obviously been capped and he's had a phenomenal year. Obviously, Munster does a bit of a backlog in back threes at the moment. But even like they're targeting lads, footballers down in Kerry, um, trying to get him into development squads and stuff. So I think, and Leinster obviously with Furlong yeah. and these guys are actively targeting guys. So. I think it's maybe an area that the Ulster branch have maybe fallen down in themselves. Like obviously there are a few have policy, but it's up to the provinces to actively go out and pursue lads. I, like obviously the GA are probably not happy with it. Um, yeah, but it's a like as you know yourself, it's sense, a chance like, to be yeah. a professional athlete. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a chance. It's a chance. Um, a chance to be a professional athlete. Like talking to a guy called Hugh Sullivan, who's in the Ireland Under 20 squad during the week. He's from Mead, played under 14, under 16, yeah. had a chance to go into the minor setup, but he's in fifth year in school at that time. And, and you know, Leinster kind of got onto him saying, You have a real chance here. So yeah. he said it wasn't really much of a decision in the end. His brothers play football and hurling for Mead, but he saw this kind of opportunity to go. And I mean, that must yeah. be hard to resist. Like. Oh, yeah. Like if we didn't have the GA, we'd be unbelievable. Well, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, I love the GA, obviously. But, um, <laughs> Like, look at the Kiwis, that's the only thing they play. Like, there's kids running around barefoot playing tag rugby. 
you know, you got, you, you got, well, <laughs> no, they, it, well, you can run it, you can play rugby barefoot too. <laughs> they have, they have shoes. You got, you, you, you go to the schoolyards and you watch them, they're playing rugby, whereas here, well, you're probably not even allowed to run in schools now because of health and safety, <laughs> which is a joke, but they're, like, they're doing full contact rugby sessions in, down in New Zealand, you go down there. Um, so they've nothing else to concentrate on sports-wise, um, whereas here it's soccer, football, hurling, well, in Cork anyway, we play everything, but mm. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not sure about any goal. Oh, but, oh, uh, it? oh. um, so it's definitely an area that we should, well, from a rugby point of view, should be targeting, but from a GA point of view, it's a big threat. What was it that swayed you in the direction of the oval ball in the end? Is it true <laughs> that it was something to do with a, a tour to Argentina with rugby? Uh, um, no. Um, nah. Chance to play with Munster and be a professional athlete, basically, earn a few bob. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't get enough, like, but um, <laughs> probably got too much for my ability. But, um, no, like, I guess, like, you know, I grew up, my old fella played hurling with Cork. He won a few All Ireland's. I grew up wanting to play with Cork. Um, <laughs> you might have heard of him. <laughs> he won four, so, um, senior. Um, <laughs> And I, that's all I wanted to do, I suppose, till I was 16, 17, and I realised that there was, a, there was a chance to play professional rugby at Munster, and obviously Munster, the bandwagon, took off, and they were in European semi-finals and finals, and as well, the chance of being a professional athlete without having to take the risk of going to Australia, or, or you know, not finish your leaving cert and go to the UK. Like, I, I was studying in UCC, I was in the Irish Academy, I was training at Munster, so it wasn't a risk, and I knew if I didn't make it, I'd go back hurling like so it was just yeah <laughs> and you would have been going back at a pretty decent time as well like there winning all Ireland's in 2004 oh there he is yeah yeah that was this that was when I put on a bit of weight yeah, that was this <laughs> um, yeah look who, who wouldn't want to play with Munster who wouldn't want to play with Ireland like um, it's an easy decision really for a kid and you get a few bob as well while you're trying to make it so put you through your college and worst case you don't make it like so it's not I think it's a no-brainer for kids even the lads who are playing football and offered offered to go down and play Aussie rules and live the professional lifestyle down in Australia for a few years what's the worst case they fail they come back after two three years they're fit they've earned a few bob and they've had a bit of crack down in Australia yeah there was actually one guy he was playing rugby as well Connor Nash is his name he went down to the AFL very good footballer as well but Leinster, I think, are keeping in touch with him, even though he's over there. Yeah. So even if he doesn't make it in the AFL, he gets another chance. But um, yeah, there's going to be competition for players from all over the place as well. But yeah, get in early, like Ulster and RFU, get in early and, and show the players that there's a pathway. Um, anybody else? One Gentleman here up the front. Um, what time does the Calcutta Cup preview show start? Is that soon? <laughs> 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 I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, there's a lot of talk, obviously, being an Englishman here, there's a lot of talk about uh, Paddy's Day Grand Slam decider. And I know professionals talk about, you know, it's the next match, next match, but as fans, we don't. So if, do you think that's a likely scenario? Do you have an opinion on whether that will happen and who might come out on top? I think it will happen. I think Ireland will be England. <laughs> <laughs> I think England are possibly the most overrated team. In oh, it all comes out. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. In, re in recent rugby history, so. How so? Oh, well, they only won. They've only won 19 or 20 games in a row. Or something, <laughs> but the opposition hasn't been great. Um, I, I just think Ireland have a better team than them. I think, like if, if I had a gun to my head and you had Ireland at relatively full strength and England at relatively full strength, I happily back Ireland and yeah. I think you just go with your instinct when it comes to that but I think going down the next World Cup I think Ireland have a, would have a better chance of winning it than England. Uh, I don't know what you think. But yeah, yeah, interesting. I was talking to someone about this yesterday and like even in terms of the development Eddie Jones hasn't really brought anyone new through. He's, he's talked about finding a seven but Chris Robshaw is pretty much yeah. still there as a seven even though he's kind of written him off before himself Eddie Jones. Um, like I do think they're unbelievably strong and that kind of forward Farrell axis is really, really impressive. But I actually think this game is, is more tricky for Ireland. I think going to Paddy, uh, going on Paddy's weekend to Twickenham, like the motivation takes care of itself. Ireland will absolutely deliver a huge performance, but this one I think is a little bit trickier. So I just hope they get over this hurdle first. I know, I know you can't kind of pick teams on paper, but like, if you're like even in the backs, like how many of that English side would get in 
in the Irish back. Like, yeah, yeah. Even I know, even, even with far, like you're delighted you, you ask go, the question. You go, you go, <laughs> like, <laughs> you go with Sexton over far. Well, I think most Irish people would. Maybe the English lads mightn't, but yeah. Mur Murray's a, a banker. Yeah. If Henshaw's fit, he's a banker. I think you have you to have Anthony Watson. Would you? Keep, keep, I do, yeah, I don't know. I played with him in London Irish and. He's unbelievable going forward, but I think he's flaky enough in the air and defensively. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm paid with him. For, yeah. Yeah. For, yeah. Well, he's, he's handy enough, like. Uh, <laughs> so he says. <laughs> <laughs> he's alright. He's probably getting the Leinster set up. I've got. I've got. Scott. Yeah, it's an interesting point. Yeah, yeah well, I don't point. know. Well, I know you don't pick teams on paper, yeah. but. Like, I, yeah. I've been impressed with England. Like, they. Uh, they're alright. They're they, right. they, they, yeah. they grind. They do grind out wins. Like their defense no, is strong. Know, yeah. They're unbelievable athletes. Like they're so powerful. There's so many carriers. Oh, they're, they're, uh, they're guys big like Atoje yeah. are like freaks of, of nature physically. Um, but yeah, it's a good point. I think. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. I think Ireland would, would just relish that opportunity yeah. to take them down a peg. Even the kind of same thing with Leinster and Saracens. I know Leinster have wanted to play Saracens so much because Saracens have had so much success. So I'd say it's kind of like that with Ireland as well. Like. Let's get, let's get to that weekend and, mm. um, and take him down a peg. I think Saracens are probably happy to see uh, a few injuries in Leinster yeah, over the yeah, last yeah. few weeks. They're probably licking their lips. What, what about our English friend? Do you reckon <laughs> the, pa the Paddy's Day uh, decider will happen? Quite, quietly confident. But uh, quietly confident because I can't be loudly confident. He's going to Wales this weekend. It's all right. You were pretty confident here for hundreds of years, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we might as well actually discuss the Calcutta Cup, Cup briefly. Like, is there a chance that um, England don't make it to the last weekend? Oh, jeez, I don't think so. I don't think Scotland Even with either. a kind of maniacal Celtic aggression that Scotland are going to bring to this game. Yeah, they will. They'll, they'll, they could improve against Scotland again, but I thought that game, or sorry, against uh, France, but I thought that game was notably lower quality than the rest of the, mm. the, ch the championships, obviously, just counting Italy. Uh, I don't think they've really kind of pushed through in the promise they showed in November. They're just not solid enough, are they? Like, they can score some great tries, they can really rip it up when, when play breaks up. Um, but even like Finn Russell just missing touch like, what, four or five times now with penalties, uh, getting intercepted a couple of times. I feel like you're smiling, you think Scotland are going to win, do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going I was just going to compliment England and say how much of a machine they are after I've just slated them. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, won, but Scotland won't win. Nah, they won't. Yeah, England will get there looking for a grand sum, I think. And yeah, it'll be up to Ireland to deny. Any, anybody else? Um, any questions about 1916? Or <laughs> 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 I've gotten over it, it's all right. <laughs> I, love, I love the English, I lived there for long enough. <laughs> you prefer the French though, I'd say, do you? Ah, some of them. <laughs> In terms of the disparity between the teams, so you kind of have France obviously have a very talented team, but they're not showing up. But what can be done to kind of bridge the gap between the likes of Scotland, who played well in the autumn internationals, but then once they come to Six Nations, they've collapsed. Essentially, they played well against France, but France are nonchalant. Like, what do you do to br bring up Italy? Do you bring in another country? Do you bring in Georgia? Or what do you do? Like, do you just constantly give them the wooden spoon? <laughs> yeah, it's like a red yeah. arse, right? Interesting to see, like, um, that the Italian clubs are actually progressing. Like, Treviso had five wins, wins in a row. Zebra obviously beat Connacht, unfortunately for the Connacht fans here. Um, so they actually are making progress there. Their, their under-20 team actually is pretty good now. We saw that against Ireland. Even with a man down, they nearly came back and, and kind of stole an unlikely victory. So. The signs of progress are probably there underneath the, the top tier. It is unbelievably frustrating that they just give up eight tries every time uh, they come over and play one of the big nations. But I think there is signs of them improving there. If you, if you throw them out of the championship, then they're going to regress unbelievably. And all that work that's gone in over the last couple of decades even uh, is, is all for nothing. It's obviously frustrating for Georgia, but I just don't think you can get rid of Italy like that now. Uh, you, I, I think you would like... You would have played against Italy in 2011 in Rome, and they actually nearly turned us over. And obviously, they did uh, beat us subsequently. But I mean, going back to the, I think it was Owen Redden who set up Roger Strockle that they actually <laughs> win the game. But you, you put in the hard, you yeah, put in the hard yards. Yeah, I went off. We were comfortable, and then <laughs> <laughs> the team here. 
<laughs> things, yeah, things let slip a bit. But um, but had they like had the rest of the teams now pulled further away from Italy, then they were like there probably was are. a kind of a five year spell where they looked like they were making small progress. But now that seems to be the, the gap is, oh, is yeah, widening. It's, it's definitely widened. But yeah, it's a straight. It's a good question, but it's it's strange because you think Irish teams, obviously Irish provinces are really strong, and that kind of feeds into the national team, like. The last few years, even when Wales are really good, they're 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 like the teams were struggling in Europe and even struggling in the league. So it doesn't necessarily correlate that when your teams are strong. Even Glasgow have had a have a, have a big push the last few years, but it hasn't translated into international rugby. So, like obviously, it's a difficult one. And they've had brilliant coaches. Um, Vern Cotter has been a, a very good coach. He's he's well renowned, but he hasn't been able to translate, you know, the Glasgow rugby into international rugby because it's a massive step up to international rugby even from European rugby um, you just don't get the space the physicality is 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 up 20 25 percent it's it's mad you think you think when you're playing even against 15 internationals in the, in the European Cup you think that that would be the same as international rugby for, but for whatever reason it isn't so um, it's just there's so much so little space until so little time in the ball so I don't know how. I'm glad I'm not an international coach. Um, I think the gap is only widening for for the top teams, and it's going to be hard to to, to, to bridge that gap. And you, but you can't kick Italy out of the competition. You just gotta yeah. like it's for revenue alone. They're not going to do it anyway. Yeah, exactly. so. And it's a great weekend anyway. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good weekend. <laughs> the, for the, the ones who get sent over there, yeah. Yeah, the really frustrating one is France. Like you know, everyone just wants to see them back to. I don't know, people growing up, no matter what your era was, like even for me, watching that kind of Toulouse inspired team uh, with Josie on yeah. and Clerk and Amans, they were unbelievable. Like, they've been left behind by professional rugby, yeah. I think. Like, the structures in the clubs, yeah. uh, even at, at a national level, even their kind of training methods, I understand, are, are quite far behind everyone else. There's too many foreigners in the league. Yeah. Like, there's um, the, co like the coaching analysis is non existent, the pro professionalism yeah. is non existent. Like, because I was in Montpellier. And obviously, the budget they have is inordinately bigger than, say, Munster or Leinster, but they don't kind of, they don't uh, mirror that with um, your investment in strength and conditioning, or investment in um, sports science, investment in fit medic medical care. Um, it's just so blasé, and the like, the analysis pre-match and post-match is like, it's, it's so so unprofessional. Like, whereas here you'd be in a in a meeting room for an hour and a half talking about what Leinster or what um, Toulouse would do, they'd be like, oh look, they might kick here, they'll do this, or X, Y, and Z, you might be in there for 10, 15 minutes, and to review the game, like it wouldn't be as scathing as back here. Yeah. Um, so like it's, and there's, we had probably 20 foreigners, and with all the will in the world, you're not invested in the club, like, like back home, you really want to play for your local province, you've grown up wanting to play with them. And they just don't have that buy-in, so um, yeah. it's just. And, you're, and then those foreign players are limiting the development of local French players. They're, they brought in new rules, they're right that they're trying to encourage. Maybe I think it's 14, 14 of the match day, the 23, GIF, yeah. have to be French qualified, yeah. or else they're going to be penalised financially and with points. So that's that's good, and I think they need that because yeah. French rugby is, yeah. is is going backwards. They have also started disciplining their players. Obviously, the, like eight guys dropped for the Italy match. Uh, some pretty strange stories coming out about that night in Edinburgh. Uh, when <laughs> one of the locks came back, he said his nose was bashed up. He heard himself jumping on his bed. That was his excuse. <laughs> and the other guy ran into a lamppost, apparently. So, yeah, the real story hasn't come out yet, but at least they're clamping down that kind of stuff. That's harsh, I think, though, isn't it? You surely have, to <laughs> have a few drinks after again. Yeah, within reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I know, yeah. yeah it's probably exactly. the right time to, uh, to run a mark if you're going to do it. Um, anybody else? One down the back, the back corner there. Uh, Tom, just wondering after um, a long career in professional rugby, is it tough being back on drinking bands in GAA? <laughs> 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 they haven't implemented that yet. Um, like, obviously, I played junior football. Like, we're a hurling club, and they wouldn't take football as seriously. So, thankfully, we didn't have a drinking ban back then. But because um, we were playing Wednesday to Saturday because it was the end of the season to fulfil the fixtures and we got to the got to the final and they did send out a, a text um, two nights before the final pleading with lads not to go the night before so that was the <laughs> <laughs> that was the extent of the drinking ban in the junior football so it wasn't uh, very draconian like um, but 
I imagine now, once we're into the hurling season, it'll be a bit stricter, all right, but um, era, I, I won't lose too much sleep about, about it. I'm sick of drinking after the dancing anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was uh, people were asking me, was it tough? But like, I was literally up here in an apartment on my own. My wife was down in Cork working, looking after her two-year-old. I was out nearly every night, um, <laughs> <laughs> drinking and, and dancing with an Italian girls. So it was, <laughs> wasn't exactly tough, like. Yeah, Lord knows how he got away with that. Isn't it funny though that you went into rugby to play professional sport and yet it's back in an amateur sport where the drink ba drinking ban will be implemented? Uh, when, when you were a professional you were able to sip away and have a few, po a few points. Yeah, it does seem strange, it's kind of... I don't know, I think GA lads are getting a bit more clued in and relaxed about it now and educated about it obviously, um, especially when it's more geared towards into county you know during the summer they almost forget about the club players and I think there's a bit of a revival and the GA is probably having a look at itself as to what the identity of the GA is about whether it's about the club player or the elite player like because I think for Cork anyway the first round of the championship is fixed for April I think there's two rounds in April and then I think it's not till August again that the club player plays like so that's just nonsensical so if your lads are skipping holidays or not drinking for the summer it just doesn't make sense so um, but I think I think attitudes are changing, and um, it's for the positive, really. You know, you have to be able to relax and enjoy yourself, obviously within reason. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else before we go, uh, gentlemen up the front here? You've been put through your paces, Adrian. One for Murray. Um, do you have any? You talked about the kind of time and play. Um, do you have any concern with the Ireland team with losing Furlong and Henderson? Like you've had an article recently about Furlong's prodigious kind of work rate around the park. Yeah. With him not there, do you think there's a, an issue? Yeah. Well, it does change what Ireland can do. Like having Ty Furlong in your team is an unbel unbelievable boost because obviously he's brilliant set piece, scrum line out. Uh, great at the rock time, he always smashes lads off the ball there. But he also gives you that playmaking ability, um, and he's one of those guys who have had a really high kind of total number of passes for Ireland. So Porter probably doesn't quite have that yet. He is quite mobile. He's a skillful guy, um, but you definitely lose something there. Um, like you're, you're just taking out two of your best players in the team, and um, having lost Henshaw, Sean O'Brien's obviously not there. Uh, so you're down to almost third choice at seven as well. So. There definitely blows and it does kind of change what they can do. Henderson as well has had, I think, maybe 12 passes over the course of those two games. Um, and so you're getting players who probably aren't as comfortable doing that uh, into the team. But like, there's only one way to find out. Like, you know, Ireland have spoken about that depth time and time again. Um, and then we find out for, for sure whether it actually, is, it actually has happened, really. Um, but the injuries are concerned. Like, there's, there's so many high-profile injuries now, isn't there? Jeez, you must be almost glad to be out of it. Like, Yep. And even players are worried about that. That's the big thing they're talking about now when they have those kind of player meetings is just the workload and, and how, how, many, how many injuries they're picking up and, and how tough it is to be a professional rugby player now. Well, I know, like, even go back to, like, Peter Romani has had maybe three or four offers that would have doubled or trebled his salary over the last couple of years, Toulouse being one of them. And one of the main reasons he didn't move to France on a permanent basis was that he realised he was going to have to play more club games and he just reckoned, my body isn't going to hold up here. You know, like, so obviously, like, it, would it be fair to say that? <laughs> <laughs> he's not exactly a milk talking here either, I'd say. So, um, <laughs> yeah, like, it's, it's, you definitely earn your, earn your crust over in France, but definitely the, the player welfare system within Ireland, especially for the, the top international lads, is, is very important. Um, they get looked after, obviously, you might see, you know, your Conor Murrays and Sexton and those guys, maybe they play the European Cup and they play in maybe the big derby games uh, within within the league, but very rarely will you see them in a, a, a mundane, I don't want to say mundane, but a, a, a normal Pro 14 game. Um, you know, so, and obviously with the Lions Tour, on the back of a Lions Tour, um, they've had an increased workload last summer, so you have to be cognizant of that fact and you have to mind your best players. And it makes sense for the RFU too, because you know, they're the guys who, uh, who create revenue off the pitch, put bums on seats for the top games. Um, so you want to protect those players and you want them for big Six Nation games and you want to keep them fit for the for World Cups down the line. So um, it's definitely a big factor in them staying here. And But like, there are a few who pay well as well. So um, yeah. boy, the boys, boys are doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just yeah. for the welfare and, system. And, and they, they have a 
better earning power off the pitch in Ireland than yeah. if they disappear to France. Like they can pick up uh, commercial deals in Fran or in, in, in Dublin and Cork, and you know. So there's a big value to staying at home as well. And obviously Peter Manny, he's captain of Munster too, so he's uh, he's doing alright for himself. <laughs> 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 well, uh, well, we might get you to. Um, so like the, the best question, um, the, I'll give you the options, give you a couple of uh, seconds to, to think about it. Uh, uh, so one of them was uh, our, our friend from Donegal talking about the, um, well, the spread of the sport throughout the country and, and whether it's too maybe centralised. Uh, there was a question about Italy's development. There was the uh, request for a Calcutta Cup preview, which is safe to say <laughs> would not be winning. Uh, <laughs> there was a question about GA drinking bans and then uh, Tyg Furlong as well. Um, while you were making your, your mind up, uh, just uh, I should have told you guys about this already, but before you go, we'd like to hear your stories uh, from supporting Ireland over the years. There's a green chair in the uh, room behind you there. Um, we wanted to get a red chair, but Graham, Graham Norton would have sued us. Uh, so <laughs> all you have to do is sit down in, in the uh, back, chair in the back of the room and you could be crowned Volkswagen Fan of the Year. So we've got a VIP weekend match experience in Dublin for the Guinness Series, including tickets and four-star accommodation for two people. And also you will present the Troy of the Year at the Rugby Players Ireland Awards and win a signed jersey. And even if you just want to give it a go, uh, you will get a free copy of the 42's book behind the lines. So, um, so <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to do it. <laughs> but yeah, that's about it. Tomas, your thoughts on... Uh, the finest question. Um, the, now, bear in mind, this this person will get two tickets to Ireland Wales, so it has to be. So I'm going to disappoint uh, four people and keep one person happy. Yeah, yeah, well, you're making two people happy, but the second person just doesn't know they're happy yet. Uh, okay, I'll I'll go for um, Italy's development. So. Oh, that was uh, very good. Well done. Someone down there, wasn't it? <laughs> Sorry, Thrusty. <laughs> <laughs> before we uh, before we take off, you are obviously confident this weekend. Ireland Ireland win for you. I'd be hopeful. Yeah, I'd be pretty confident. Yeah, I think we'll win by a score. Murray, what do you reckon? Yeah, I'm still gonna stick with prediction to, for Ireland to win. Uh, I was kind of surprised by the margin. To be honest, this week it's, it was as high as 12 points. Yeah, that's it. crazy, isn't it? It's handy money for everyone in the room, I think. Um, yeah. Under. Yeah, but it's gone down seven now. I think even that's a little bit high. I think it's gonna be. A, Penalty, maybe four points, mm. even a kind of late, late score. Uh, but I do think we've mentioned Murray and Sexton; they've still got them in place in the team. And those guys, if they can play pretty much the eighty minutes, I think Ireland will have enough control, uh, enough kind of good decision making to to get over the line, even with those injuries. Brilliant! That is all we have time for, guys. Thanks so much for coming. Hope you enjoyed. <laughs> well, thanks to Murray Kinsel of the 42.e and a massive thank you to Tomas O'Leary as well for joining us and to the uh, sponsors of the event Volkswagen uh, we apologise for Tomas's uh, Republican rhetoric halfway through the show <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm only joking thanks a million <laughs> cheers folks thanks a lot hope you enjoyed